if you're a regular listener to Inside Reproductive Health, this might not be the episode for you. This is for those who are not yet in our field because we sometimes get people that are still in residency, maybe sometimes still in medical school. They're looking into the field because they want to come work in your field and they use this podcast as a resource. So I took advantage of that with Dr. Jamin Shaw. This episode is really for OBGYN residents who are applying to REI fellowship or maybe to some med students that are going into residency that know that they want to subspecialize or at least strongly feel about it. For those of you that are in the field, I'm going to do a different interview with Dr. Shaw about how to attract those candidates that you want. But this is for those folks that are doing the applying. And if that's you, what I talk about with Dr. Shaw is how you find your mentor, the difference between senior and junior mentorships, a delineation that Dr. Shaw use that I wish I had used in different aspects of my life, how to attract those mentors or how to reach out to them. We talk about what kind of networking OBGYN residents need to do. We talk about what the average candidate looks like to REI programs. We talk about the importance of offside rotations as a competitive advantage. And speaking of how do candidates look to REI programs, we break candidates into three different tiers based on the amount of research that they've done. And Dr. Shaw gives us numbers of first author publications that make sense for each tier. Dr. Shaw applied to over 40 programs. He got interview offers from at least 30 of them. He went on 18 interviews interviews and he got his second choice and this is a really competitive field so I hope you take advantage of these tips and if you are to join this field welcome I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jamin Shah. Dr. Shah, Jamin, welcome to Inside Reproductive Health. Thank you for having me today Griffin. It's good to have you on because we became friends from you listening to the show and then us corresponding and then we got to meet in person and that was probably a couple years ago that it started and now I consider you a friend and it's cool to have you on to do a topic for an audience that normally isn't a part of our audience but I still find some of those folks so a lot of times we're not covering content for residents we talk to REI fellows a lot but have not really created anything further up the channel for those folks that are considering going into REI. And I want to take advantage of your experience to have that for that little audience, invite those folks that aren't even in this world yet, and talk about what they need to know to make them more attractive for getting into the REI fellowship program that they want to. So can you give us a little bit of context of yourself and what your process was like? And then I'm just going to give you more specific questions. Well, thank you. I mean, it's it's great to, you know, broaden the audience. I think the um, REI potential, you know, the residents that are potential um, interested in REI fellowship are obviously the seeds to make our field grow. So I think trying to reach that group is, is important. Um, but I, you know, I came from uh, UT Houston um, OBGYN residency, so was not affiliated with an REI program. And uh, learning that process from a resident perspective um, and working with various mentors was was key to my success um, in matching into REI fellowship. So I do have a couple of tips, you know, I wanted to to, to share with other potential residents interested in, in the REI field. How early did you start? Because it seems to me that some people know that they want to subspecialize even before they go to medical school. And then other people don't know until well into residency. When did you start the process of deciding this is something that I'm going to move on to do? Well, to be honest, I I was doing quite a bit of research when I was a medical student because I stayed at the same medical school program into uh, residency. So I was doing lots of research in G1 oncology. Actually, that's, I thought, the route I was going to be taking until I pivoted during my intern year. Um, so I started pretty early on doing research, and, and that's one thing I'll touch on later in the episode is that starting on any kind of research is important early on, even if you think you might have an inkling that you might want to do any sort of fellowship. So what was the first research that you did? What did that look like? I mean, I started as a you know first and second year uh, medical student doing emergency medicine research, um, and then because that was one of my initial interests, and then I kind of slowly pivoted into women's health, into OBGYN, and doing G1 oncology research with MD Anderson, 
Um, and then that slowly pivoted into when I was an intern, transitioning to more fertility preservation, and then trying to broaden my horizon um, onto other different REI topics. In addition to, I was also uh, contributing on MFM research because we had a, a robust MFM department. What are REI fellowship programs looking for in your view? Well, what they're looking for is, first of all, a well-rounded applicant with research experience. I think research is um, a big part of of what they're looking for, of, of what your prior experience was, even if it was REI research or non-REI research. Um, trying to find someone with a um, passion to learn new research techniques and interviewing research projects early on. Um, also having an, an applicant with good letters of recommendation from REI and non-REI mentors who can speak on behalf of their abilities um, and speak on their experience of working with that specific resident. And then most importantly, obviously trying to find a hardworking resident who could be a good fit for their fellowship, who could flourish um, and utilize all the resources that would, would be available in that fellowship program. There are how many REI fellowship programs? 40, 44. Do you know the exact number? I don't know the exact number. I feel like it can range between 40 and 50. I think my year there was like 41 because there was, you know, a handful of programs that took internal candidates. And I think it varies from year to year, but I think that's the general ballpark of about 40 to 48 or so. However many there were your year, you applied to all of them. Why? I think as an applicant, um, obviously I had, I wasn't limited by geographic constraint. Um, so I wanted to kind of put my hat in the ring for all, all programs, right? I think it's always better to try to apply to all programs early on versus trying to add programs later down the line. Um, because, you know, programs are going to be reviewing applications from the get go. Um, and so trying to be in the front of the line is, is important, I think. Did you make that known to the programs that you were applying to? No, I mean, I just applied to all of them, right? You submit the application. It's it's one uh, application. You have your letters of recommendation in the kind of the portal. Um, and you can you can submit to all programs and then see if they would be interested in offering you an, uh, an interview spot. And you got quite a few. You got 30 interview offers uh, about that out of, you know, low 40s, however many it would have been. What do you think that you did to get that many interview offers? I think someone told me early on was from a research perspective, you know, there's different there, there's different tiers as far as kind of the number of publications you can have there. You know, most most resident applicant, applicants will kind of have one to two first author papers. I think the next tier might have three to four. And I think in the top tier of of applicants might be, you know, five first author publications in addition to other research that you've be contributed on. So I think that is one that you kind of have direct control about as a resident. Um, so if you were in that category, you could potentially stand out a little bit more compared to other applicants. Someone told me that early on. So then I took that to heart and said, you know what, I want to try to be in that top tier and, and try to work very hard of getting a lot of research out um, and learn the process. Um, and in that, I think that was one thing that did uh, stand out in my application. Sounds like you did, because if I have my notes right, you did 10 first author publications while you were a resident? Uh, yes. And our tiers were, so the third tier is what, one or one or two, you said? I think the third tier, tier would be kind of five plus. Well, you and I are going backwards. Okay. So uh, third, let's, bottom one, bottom one is one or two? I would say so on average. And middle is three or four? Correct. And then the top tier is five plus. So you were yes. like, I'm going to comfortably sit up in this top tier here. When did you start on that? At the very beginning of residency? Like I said, I had some projects I was working on as a fourth year medical student um, that were more G1 oncology specific um, and then kind of pivoted into kind of fertility preservation and then more into REI based projects. So I started, I would say fourth year medical school and then really going in, um, in my intern year, my first year residency. So if you want to be in the top tier for the number of first author publications we're referring to, you have to start pretty early. In your case, you started even before residency. Is it too late by the end of residency? By the end of residency is too late. Cause obviously you'd be graduating. Um, I mean, you can continue after uh, residency, but you, you're going to be applying uh, for REI fellowship during your third year of residency. 
So it's really good to know if you have an inkling to do any sort of fellowship, and that's important to start on any kind of research early on in your residency training. Um, and even if you pivot to another subspecialty like I did, it still showed that I saw, I you know, uh, developed a project, um, you know, created, developed it, collected data, um, presenting at a conference, and then published it. And so it kind of shows fellowship program directors that, okay, this applicant, you know, created a project with the mentor, saw it through, presented it, and published it, right? It shows that 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 resident applicant is capable of, of learning research and doing research. And you have to understand there's certain constraints, but certain programs may or may not have as many resources um, like an REI division or not. So you did that and it made you attractive enough to at least 30 programs to offer you an interview. Is there other things that you think other than the research that you authored that made you invited to those interviews? Yeah, I mean, in more of a general, you know, I think there's six other points um, that I think, you know, apply, apply to my case, but more broadly um, would be trying to find good mentors, junior and senior mentors, um, considering away rotations, um, making sure that you're networking as much as possible throughout your residency career, utilizing your available resources, um, you know, thinking about different wow factors that you might have in your prior um, experience. And then there's, I think the other component is uh, CREOG scores. Let's talk about the the networking for a minute, because there are some conferences in our field that are very fellows heavy, but residents sometimes go there for whatever, maybe they work on a paper and they get to submit their abstract, somebody sponsors them, they get a scholarship of some some kind. And I have talked to a couple of those people, and they're not totally sure if they even want to subspecialize in ARIA. Let's pretend they're a first or a second year resident, and somehow they get to one of these conferences. I know people will say, you can't go to PCRS or whatever, uh, some other conference if you're a first year resident. You can't. I've seen them there. So they're there sometimes. But so let's say they're early on in residency. What should be they be doing to network there if they find themselves at one of these conferences? I think beforehand, trying to reach out uh, amongst other local fellows in, in respective programs and trying to get to know them, get their numbers. That's what I did. And some of those fellows kind of took me in there under the wings and introduced me to people. Um, I was picking their brains about how, how they went about it. You know, they introduced me to their mentors. So I was basically trying to talk to as many people as I could to learn their experience. How could they help me or how could, you know, they give me some advice to make sure further my agenda of making sure I, you know, successfully match into REI fellowship. How did you decide upon which mentors you wanted to mentor you? It's a great question. So I had junior mentors and uh, senior mentors. Um, so junior mentors, I would say, are fellows. You know, I had um, Neil Chapel. Um, he was a Baylor uh, fellow, and I reached out to him and a bunch of fellows, and and. He kind of took me under his wing and it was great to kind of get his experience and get his advice. And so I worked on some projects with him, right? So he was more of my, my junior mentor. Um, you know, senior mentors, you know, we had some affiliations and some private practices. Um, and that was just me networking, reaching out to different um, programs, um, you know, Baylor and other private physicians and trying to find um, uh, physicians that might be willing to take on a resident on a certain project. Um, and then really kind of diving into learning more about their experience and kind of how I can better myself as an applicant. Earlier in my career, I was really obsessed with learning how to acquire mentors. I find that as you advance in your career and you get better, it's actually easier to acquire mentors because you sometimes just start doing business with them or you have similar interests. And so y you can acquire mentors a little bit more readily. But in the beginning of my career, I had to be really intentional about it. And I never thought in terms of junior and senior mentors. Where did you come up with that framework? It was something I just learned along the ways because you'll get advice from two different people and they could be doing the same exact thing, but one is a little bit more senior and one's a little more junior. And I think they're closer to the experience of REI fellowship. And I needed to, to get that advice and input of, of directly of over these next one to two years that are kind of going to be critical to my success of getting the REI fellowship, 
how did they do it? What what suggestions do they have for me? What did, didn't work for them? Um, what did you wish you knew, right? So those are all the questions I was asking you know, a lot of the REI fellows and, and they have that um, that direct insight because they're, they're living in that process recently versus someone who might be 10 or 15 years out and it's just a little bit different of how they came about that process. I think you are smart to not view each of those as mutually exclusive. Like I struggled for a long time thinking about this for financial advisors because I look at a lot of the younger financial advisors and I'm like, well, they don't have the experience. They never actually really built wealth because in order to build wealth, it has to stand the test of time. It's got to be decades. But then I worry about some of the older financial advisors if they are leaving things on the table, ignoring some of the new technologies, the new types of trading, the new types of asset classes and, and everything else. And I always kind of viewed it as it had to be one or the other. And I think you more wisely said, no, I've got, there, there's two different classes and I want each of them. Correct. For those that were more senior, how did you approach them? You know, we were affiliated with the private REI group. Um, and I knew the constraints to that in the sense that, you know, they're private clinicians. They don't have as much dedicated time um, to, to education and to, res uh, to residents. So I kind of reached out to do, uh, different uh, Baylor faculty, reached out to other other private clinicians. I, I literally emailed and, and called different programs in the city of Houston to figure out who could take me on as a resident for research and then kind of use that as a as a segue into kind of trying to pick their brain and, and trying to see if they could be a, a mentor for me. Picking up the phone and calling the office? Yep. Sometimes if they didn't respond via email, then I reached out to the next source and saying, hey, can I get in touch with this doctor? I'm a resident in the local area, interested in in talking to them. And that's what I did for a lot of programs around um, the city. How often did it work? Most times it usually worked. Were you nervous about being perceived as a salesman or does the distinction that you offer really quickly, hey, I'm a resident, did that help? I think it helped when they said I was, when I said I was a resident. And it was one of those things that I learned very on in my career, the worst that someone can say is no. And so it's okay if someone said no or didn't call back or didn't reply back to an email, then I just try to the next one. One of the other tips that you gave in addition to networking was, and mentors, was offsite rotations. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so I did an away rotation um, and, I, and I used that as a strategy to learn more and go to a different program for a month. Um, to uh, you know, continue to work on research, and to also try to find a good mentor that could you know write a good letter recommendation in addition to getting great experience. Um, you know, I came from a non um, REI. Uh, uh, I didn't have an REI division um, for as far as the fellowship goes, so I was trying to utilize doing an away rotation as another way to kind of think outside the box of how to. Um, make my application a little stronger. And that was one idea that a previous resident had done before. And I kind of utilized that as a great idea to try to do an away rotation. And it, it was a great experience. I learned a lot. Um, and now I you know, kind of a lifelong mentor um, along the process. Like how much do you have to do to do an away rotation? Do you have to go through your program? Can you submit that to your own program? Hey, are these other places that I would like to rotate into? How does that work? Well, first you have to make sure that your residency program allows and has the ability to do a one month rotation. Luckily, my program um, had the ability to give me that opportunity. Um, and then I talked to, you know, the different um, REI clinicians in town who maybe had some suggestions and some insight and some programs. And that's kind of how I use that um, uh, route. And they kind of put me in touch with uh, that mentor at that institution. And then connected me via email and they agreed to take me on. And that's kind of how that process started. So not every residency program allows for Correct. away rotations. Yeah. I think it just depends on the curriculum. And then does it also vary per program's curriculum? What types of institutions that you can do that rotate? Does it have to be an REI division within an academic system? Can it be at a private practice? What's that like? I think it's kind of endless um, as far as the the kind of the different type of program you can go to. Um, I wanted to go to a program that had an REI division 
um, that was more academic affiliated, um, just because of thinking about a potential mentor who could, you know, write you a good letter recommendation. You know, that's something you have to take into consideration as well. What tips do you have for applicants as they're going into the interview? As they're going into the interview, um, you know, I think you want to create a list of questions that you want to ask all programs. Um, I would recommend asking the same question to multiple people during the interview process to see if you get the same answer. Um, you know, and try to think about, and I would recommend talking to a current REI fellow to help create some of these questions for you. Um, you know, I have a list of them too that I had created um, with a bunch of different REI fellows that they felt were important to ask um, about numbers and about hours and about monitoring and basic things you may not think to ask. So I would ask a lot of the same questions to multiple people in an interview to see if I got similar, same responses or different responses. Right? And that was kind of a telltale sign if there was if there was some discrepancy. Um, and another thing that I found very helpful um, going in the interview process was to make a real-time rank list. Um, you go through the process and a lot of programs blend. Like, okay, every program, most programs are, are really good. They're going to get you a great education, but you're really going to uh, find comb and try to find look at the fine details and that can get very um blended when you go on multiple interviews and so i would i would jot down notes immediately when i left and when i was in the car or in the lobby and just what was so you mean physically when you say a real-time rank list you're talking about physically not just up in your head you're you're noting it out i had notes in my phone and i would i started ranking programs because it was one of those things that you want to trust your gut um, as far as kind of what, what did that program really make you feel good? Did you feel a good fit? Did you feel welcomed, et cetera? So I would go before I left the premises, I would jot down notes of things that stood out to me, things I liked, didn't like, things I need follow-up questions on, right? Because it was fresh in my mind. Um, and then I would go to my next tab and go put my rank list together. And I literally had a running rank list. Um, and it was the best thing because by interview 10 or 12, they really start blending it together. Like, did they do monitoring? How many retrievals did they do? Did the fellows do transfers? Like, do I have to take call? Or, you know, like, what's the call structure? Like, you know, how many faculty? Like, those, those little things are very hard to remember. Um, and it's very hard to go back. And so that was one thing um, that I, I learned from someone that and I, it, was, it, was, it was a blessing because if I didn't do that, it would have been very hard to really comb through some of those details. Um, so that was also really helpful. Um, and the other, other tip was pick the program you think you're going to be the happiest at. Um, don't pick the program that you think that you need to be at. Um, I think now going into the REI fellowship, this is kind of hopefully the last stop for you. You want to pick a program that you think you're going to excel at, that you're going to be happy at. Um, and that was one of the biggest things, uh, that I took away from that is don't necessarily assess the interviews as a way for you to make your rank list. Because to be honest, most interviews are pretty relaxed. They're very conversational. And you think honestly, every interview goes well, at least how I felt in the REI um, fellowship realm, because everyone is very happy in the field that the conversations are very nice. So it's really hard to tease out a, a pleasant interview experience versus do they really like me? Because to be honest, I bet they are like that with pretty much most applicants because that's just the general nature of the field. Um, and so I think that's where you got to trust your gut and pick the program that you're, you think you're going to be the happiest at and not the other way around. So when you say pick by where you think you're going to be the most happiest, you're saying as opposed to where you think, as opposed to thinking based on how they're ranking you? Correct. Because it, it, it's a rank system, right? So it's supposed to be in favor of the applicants. Um so I think you have the trust of where you think you're being the happiest and it's all going to work out in the end. And it, it does when you talk into most of my other friends and colleagues around the country, it all works out kind of how you make the rank list. In your real time rank list, did you put those different factors that you have in one kind of general note section or did you have very specific criteria like in different columns of your rank list so that you made sure you were comparing each of the programs on similar criteria? It's a great, it's a great, great question. So I actually made a note section and I kind of had my freehand notes for every program. And then it was actually my, my wife's idea to 
make a, an Excel list and do exactly what you said, kind of put um, surgical volume, number of embryo transfers, geographic concern, you know, geographic location, um, you know, call structure, um, research opportunities, and put some of those so I could actually rank um, each program for those specific categories. And that was actually really helpful to look at my first rank list and then look at my final rank list. And it actually turned out to be very similar in the end, but it was a good exercise to go through it um, uh, to, to really look at some of the, um, the nuances to the interview process. When you say that it was similar, your first rank list and your final rank list, you mean before you ever went on the interviews you ranked Sorry, I, should, I should rephrase that. It's actually when I finished the interviews and like my running rank list compared to my final rank list after looking at my kind of Excel file that I went through. How long did you take to digest from you finished your last interview and you've got your running rank list versus, okay, now I have to make my final decision. How long did you give yourself? I had a few weeks um, and I kind of after my last interview, I gave myself a good four or five day just pause um, just to kind of process and digest and just kind of reflect and then went back to the list and back to the criteria to help me um, rank. For the running list, did you, you're going into interview number eight, you walk out of there and you're like, okay, I think that they're number three. And so you just put them at the number three spot. Was it in real time like that? Yep, exactly. Did that skew your perception in any way of thinking like, okay, now I have to, well, you know, I've already got these eight and I feel so strongly because this one has been at number one since you know, the third week. Uh, did that did that skew your perception in any way? No, it, it kind of just, it kind of really, when you have a couple good, you know, three or four programs that you really like, that would be very hard to choose from, right? Those are a good comparison when you go into a new interview as far as, well, I like this about that I can do transfers and I can do as many retrievals as a fellow. Right. I think that's a really good thing. Right. So that was really a thing that was important to me. And so when I heard about, oh, yeah, you would get to do 10 transfers across the whole fellowship and you, you'd get limited experience in retrievals or things like that. Right. Like, so those are things that you had a benchmark of saying, well, this is where I've heard a program that wouldn't allow me to do such things. Or I would have this access to this research opportunity that this program doesn't have. And you can internally figure out when you go through the interview process what you value and don't value for your future education. Do you remember the criteria that you had in your real-time list? What you said, I think cycle volume or number of transfers. What were the criteria as far as you can remember? Procedures was definitely one one big one, looking at transfers, retrievals, um, looking at the your research opportunities. What have prior fellows done? I wanted to get really into like prospective and randomized controlled trials. I wanted to go to a center that would give me the ability to do that as a fellow versus just retrospective studies. I wanted to have the ability to do translational research. I wanted a program that had, you know, you know, decent surgical volume, not heavy surgical volume, but not very low, coming something in the middle. Um, I wanted to have the ability to have my own fellows clinic, like where I was the attending and I had supervision, but I was the one making the decision because I think that's really important. Um, I think uh, geography was also a, a factor, a lower factor. Um, uh, I had uh, a wife category in there as well. My wife had to say, um, for my, my partner had to say, because, you know, happy wife, happy life, right? So that was also an important factor um, in there as well of where she might want to go, where opportunities would be good for her. Um, so that was another piece. I think those are the some that kind of come to mind. Many of those things are an individual's preferences. Are there some things that you think are must-haves or should be must-haves regardless of someone's preferences? So the amount of clinical work or if there's a fellow's clinic where they can be attending or if, uh, yeah, based, what kinds of research opportunities are available? A lot of that will have to do with someone's preferences. But are there a few things that you feel should be in everybody's must-have list? And if so, what are they? I think procedures as a fellow is key. Um, I, it's, a, it's a small thing in some people's eyes, but I think it's a big thing in, in most fellows' eyes. I think there's a lot of buzz about you know transfers and retrievals. I think that's definitely up there. Um, the ability to do other ancillary procedures, the HSGs, water ultrasounds, 
just being able to do lots of hands-on procedure and surgical things are important. Um, and I think the fellows clinic of really getting a robust uh, clinical experience, not just working with other um, uh, attendings, but actually having your own true clinic where you're kind of running the show, I think is really important. I think those are the two main things because, um, you know, every program is going to have research, um, just different uh, facets of research. How common is that or not is that to have a fellows clinic where you're the attending? I feel like half the programs kind of had it to some extent. Um, but, you know, in the program I ended up matching at was back and I have at a true fellows clinic where you're running, you're running everything. You have a, you have a, a, a t- assigned team, you have nurses, you have financial counselors, right, that are kind of assisting you in doing those things. Um, and then you obviously have attending supervision to some extent, but it was really kind of my own clinic that with my own patients that they were booking under my name. And, and I think that was a great, really great experience as, as, a, as a fellow to really have the autonomy to make those decisions, cycle my own patients. Um, and that, that taught me a lot. So you were talking with other folks that were also applying to fellowship and you gave the advice to ask the same question of multiple people in a program. And you, re- you rattled off a few of those questions, just making a, a different point. What were some of those questions that you made sure that you asked every person in any, every, any given program? It's kind of touching the same stuff. You know, the, the research experience is what, um, you know, what have prior fellows done? Um, are there any limitations on what I could do as a research, research perspective? Could I do randomized control trials? Can I do a prospective trial? Has that been done before? Um, understanding the numbers. When can I start doing procedures? When will I start getting that experience? Uh, asking about, you know, the call structure, understanding, you know, will you have moonlighting opportunities? Um, you know, understanding that call structure, I think, is, is important. Um, understanding um, the, the structure of the program. Um, certain programs are structured differently. You do research or do clinical first, understanding some of what flexibility you may have in that. You know, understand if you want to do other electives that you might have an interest in. I think that's also important to ask too. What does the average candidate look like in your view? And I'm going on a bit of an assumption that you are were not an average candidate and didn't appear as an average candidate to most of the programs because you had done a lot of research, you've thought a lot about that. And by research, I mean, research into different kinds of fellowship programs, but also what you authored as a resident, having 10 first author publications, having four other papers that you contributed to that being at least double what we would consider the basement for our top tier here. You don't have to be humble about this. I actually want to know what do you think the average candidate looks like to in the eyes of programs being on from the applicant side and then being then on you know the fellowship standpoint to kind of see kind of the trend of applicants i I think the average candidate you know would have one to two first author papers with being on maybe two other papers that they contributed a second or third author i think most applicants would have at least one national rei conference presentation, either a poster or an oral presentation. Um, a lot have more. Um, and then coming in with um, at least one to two very strong letters of recommendation within the REI community. Damon, I've asked you a lot and you've given us a lot on how to select a mentor, how to approach a mentor, how to network, how to think about getting other opportunities if there isn't the rotation that you want through your program. Uh, how to think about getting started on research. How would you like to conclude with this audience that I haven't created that much content for in the past, but these are the folks that are either going to be your colleagues or not in, in the next couple of years, but they, they might be your peers and they're making that decision now. How do you want to conclude with them? Find good mentors early. Um, don't be afraid to, to, to reach out and kind of extend yourself. Um, The worst that someone can say is no, move on to the next. Um, Work hard to organize your research projects early on, present at national meetings, and carry through at the end and and publish that paper. Um, So truly try to get a few first author publications and get on a couple other projects with other colleagues. And establish connections, build connections, um, learn from the junior and senior mentors that you have within your program or in your local area. And I think the most important thing is 
be a great resident and be a team player. I think that really helps um, you develop as a resident and then hopefully develop as, as a great fellow. And I think you were both, and you are also a great guest to have on for us to give some generous counsel for those that are thinking about this step. And hopefully many of them will consider it because we love adding to the number of good REIs in this field, and the field has nothing but upward to go. So I appreciate you coming on to cover the topic. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Inside Reproductive Health Podcast with Griffin Jones. If you're ready to take action to make sure that your practice thrives beyond the revolutionary changes that are happening in our field and in society, visit fertilitybridge.com to begin the first piece of the fertility marketing system, the goal and competitive diagnostic. Thank you for listening to Inside Reproductive Health.